Uh, good evening, everyone, or good morning or good afternoon, whichever part of the world you're joining us from. Uh, welcome to the last day of the Urban Lens uh, Film Festival. This is the eighth edition of the festival that we have. And um, usually the festival takes place in the cities of Bangalore and New Delhi. Uh, but because of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, this is the second year in a row we've had to have the festival online. Uh, while this is somewhat disappointing uh, for people who like to sit in a dark room and watch films. What this is also meant is that, um, you know, many more people from across different geographies can join us. So really lovely to um, have all of you here today. Um, this is um, this is the penultimate panel uh, of the Urban Lens Film Festival, and in this um, in this session, um, filmmaker Nina Sabdani will be in conversation with Paramita Vora. Uh, many of you who've joined us, uh, I'm fairly sure, are familiar with Nina's work and also familiar with Paramita's work. But um, the reason we actually um, have this uh, discussion, we, we've called it a masterclass. But basically, this is Urban Lens's commitment to have filmmakers speak about their own work. As I very, very often say that filmmakers create the work and then um, show, usually a film critic or an academic uh, writes about it. And we at the festival feel like it's important for filmmakers to reflect about their craft, uh, to think about their journey over a period of time and what is it that they create and why they create it. And as importantly, the context in which they make it. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, Nina Sabnani uh, with us today. And she will be in conversation with uh, Paramita Vora. Before I hand it over to Paramita, um, I'm going to introduce uh, both of them. Uh, Nina Sabnani is an artist and storyteller who uses film, illustration, and writing to tell her stories. Graduating from the Faculty of Fine Arts, Baroda, she received a master's degree in film from Syracuse University, New York, which she pursued as a Fulbright Fellow. Her doctoral thesis on the Kavad tradition has been published in a book, Kavad Tradition of Rajasthan, A Portable Pilgrimage. Nina's research interests include exploring the dynamics between words and images in storytelling. Her work in film and illustrated books seeks to bring together animation and ethnography. Um, Nina has made many films, some of them being Mukund and Riyaz, uh, Tanko Boloche, Nina, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, Baat Wahi Hai. Her film, Hum Chitra Banate Hai, made in collaboration with Bheel artist Shesh Singh from Madhya Pradesh, received the National Award for the Best Animation Film from the President of India at the 64th National Awards in 2016. In 2018, Nina received the Lifetime Achievement Award for illustration from Tata Trust at the Tata List uh, Festival Live in Mumbai. In 2021, Nina received the Legend of Indian Animation Award from Toons Media Group. Currently, she is Chair of Immersing Learning at Srishti Manipal Institute of Art and Design and Technology. Uh, welcome, Nina. This is the first time we are having you over at the Urban Lens Film Festival, and I'm sure many more to come from now onwards. She will be in conversation with Paramita Vora. Um, if you know anything about Urban Lens or have been attending it over years, you would know Paramita. And of course, you, I'm sure, are, read uh, her writings in, in, in public spaces. Paramita is, uh, we've shown Paramita work. She's been on our panels and she's an ally of the festival is how I'd like to think. Uh, and Paramita is a, a filmmaker, writer and dedicated Antrakshri player. I would never want to play with you because I'm terrible at Antakshri, whose work mixes fiction and non-fiction to explore themes of urban life, popular culture, love, desire and gender. Some of her films as director includes Partners in Crime, Morality Teaving and The Loving Jihad, A Thrilling Tale, Q2P, where Sandra, Cosmopolis, Two Tales of a City, Unlimited Girls, and The Amorous Adventures of Megha and Shaku in the Valley of Consent, among others. I'm very happy to say that most of the films have been screened at the festival. Uh, she's, uh, she's the writer of fiction feature Khamosh Pani, uh, or Silent Waters, several documentaries, the play Ishkia Dharavi Ishtail, and the comic Priya's Mirror. Her fiction and non-fiction writing has been widely published and she writes a weekly opinion column, Paranormal Activity in Sunday Midday. She is the founder and creative director of Agents of Ishq, India's best love website about sex and desire. Uh, welcome, Paramita, and thank you so much uh, for agreeing so generously to be part of the festival and to be in conversation with Nina. I now hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, Hello, everybody. And 
I'm excited to be talking to Nina Sabnani, whose work I've, I want to say I've admired, but the truth is just experienced tremendous pleasure uh, through seeing over the years. Uh, and it, uh, to have this conversation gave me a chance to revisit it. And a lot of it is on YouTube. So first of all, I encourage everyone who hasn't had a chance to watch the films to treat yourself to that sometime soon, like maybe right after the conversation. Um, hi, Nina. Um, I I wanted to start uh, by asking you so many questions at the same time, but I'm going to ask you about your lunchbox from when you were a kid. I watched an interview of yours and you talked about how you had a lunchbox which you loved and to me it seemed uh, like, a, like the perfect beginning of your artistic journey in some ways. So could you tell us about it? <laughs> yes, you know, this was the time when uh, they would show animation before the main features in any, and we were living in a very small town called Baruch. And uh, I used to think that the animated characters were real people. And I used to wait for the, uh, you know, the show after the end of the show, I'd wait for everyone to leave so I could see the actors leave. I thought they would come out, you know, from behind the screen and walk home. So, and one of them was on my lunchbox, Donald Duck. So, because Disney was what, you know, you get to get to, you got to see, you know, in the features, you know, before the main feature, which was for the parents. But for us, it was just the show was at the, you know, the most important part was at the beginning of the screening. And then after that, we just went to sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the, the way that you spoke about your lunchbox it reminded me a little bit about the way that you speak about the Kavat almost, right? I mean, a lot of your work has been around uh, looking at the Kavat and what it represents in storytelling terms. But it's also, after all, a box, a box of stories in a sense. Uh, yes, so, I mean, we would come, I will come to your, dis your engagement with the Kavat later, but from that lunchbox to becoming an animation filmmaker, it's an unusual journey because it's not like there were Indian animators aplenty when we were young. Uh, and when you were a kid. So how did it come to be that you studied art but ended up becoming an animator? Uh, you could call me a reluctant animator, Paro, because I never wanted to do animation. It was my teacher. In uh, There were two teachers, actually. One was Jaram Patel, and who actually told me about the program uh, in NID, which uh, you know just been announced. And I had just finished my fine arts college. And the other teacher was Nasreen Mohammadi, who kind of predicted that I don't see you painting, Nina. Then I was really upset because this was a person I adored and, you know, we walked in her footsteps and how come she thinks I can never make it as an artist. So she said, I don't see you painting, but I see you drawing and I see movement. And she didn't know anything about animation. But Jaram Patel literally pushed me to go to NID to study animation and that's how I landed up being there. And of course, uh, we had this Darshan Film Society in uh, Baroda Fine Arts College where actually I got to see, you know, films by from the National Film Board of Canada, which is what then turned my, you know, I mean, I, I got excited about animation because it wasn't about a dog and a cat you know all this all this chasing though as a kid one enjoyed it but i i didn't see myself doing that as a creative process you know so it was very nice to see these films from the film board of canada ishu patel used to you know come he was an nid alumni uh, and so he used to come every year to nid and bring you know films from the film board so we got further you know inputs into animation from him so I would say, yeah, it was it was a slow but a sure kind of, you know, slowly I kind of got into it. I, I wasn't from childhood, though I, I mean, when you talk about the box, I'm thinking, yes, there was something there. But yeah. I mean, the reason I thought about the box was because while both while watching your interviews and also uh, looking at the kind of storytelling crafts that you have been attracted to, uh, and worked with, it reminded me very much of my own childhood and some storybooks 
that would have these extremely beautiful pictures or pictures that seemed extremely beautiful at that time and that even until now sometimes i crave that picture and it's a funny thing to say that you crave the picture but i guess we crave the feeling that that feeling that is not reality it's a kind of fantasy uh and that we step into and uh a feeling that we carry with us somehow in a strange way as we go forward so i i think i'm curious to uh understand how you know when animations not a known quantity in a sense you're 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 attending like the first animation you were in the first batch of people who studied in that course right so what is even the imagination of what kind of animator you're going to become like what kind of animation did you think you would do and how different has your journey been from what you imagined then so um as a part of the program we actually saw a lot of films from poland uh, polish animation and they were very dark actually quite dark and uh, they were nothing like uh, what usually is associated with animation you know the a very uh, slapstick humor and uh, almost sexist also sometimes but you know uh, these films which i saw uh, from and uh, the czech republic from zagreb you know zagreb film festivals they were um, uh, they they were quite uh, political even you know and uh, the beautiful uh, art as well so it was a fantastic combination of you know i had a problem continuing with art as well you know i found that the people who appreciate the art most can never afford it you know mm -hmm. whereas i think cinema you know spoke to me i felt that you know it could it was kind of accessible to to everyone so so that way i had that you know um i could move towards it uh quite uh, you know um easily though at that point uh, we had a professor who came uh, from england and um, he showed us films by students as well you know from his college uh, that made they made films on all kinds of things so he he kind of uh, told us that why do you have to do it the disney yeah nothing against disney and nor do i but uh, you know why do you have to borrow this kind of a language you have such a rich heritage you know why don't you look at that so one of the earliest films that i made you know was i wanted it to be a collaboration but it couldn't be because at that point i also didn't know how to do this collaboration and uh, we didn't even have the technology to work from a distance with the madhubani artists but they had made these paintings on a which is an anti dowry kind of paintings so i i i i you know so i think that was my one of my earliest films that i made you know uh, with another com with the community though at that point i was not at all aware that this is what i'm doing and then i went on to make another film uh, which i actually animated the draw a uh, 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 story made by my teacher kg subramanian it's called a summer story so again uh, here the whole uh, challenge was how to interpret his language how to interpret a written story into a moving kind of a, you know narrative so i don't think my work went too further away to where it is now it just got a little more aware of its you know what it's doing uh, yeah i did some uh, work of course which was you know for television and which wasn't uh, you know uh, any way ethnographic or working with communities but i think somewhere uh, behind uh, i always liked working with people and you know with, with the way they imagined worlds and then how i interpreted them so so i would say that it's uh, like a yeah well, like a gradual journey rather than a rupture of any sort what was the, the first film that you made with the madhubani artist what was it about it was called shubh viva <laughs> and it was uh, a you know a woman in in their way that the story that they had made 
it was a very simple story of, you know, there were four paintings basically. So this uh, woman is going to get married and the dowry is, you know, the, the fa family demands a dowry. So the woman says, I won't marry you, you know, I won't get married if, you know, you have this dowry. And then they call the police. And then, the, you know, the, the man's uh, family says, we're very sorry, we will not take dowry. And then, you know, the marriage happens. So that was their story. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I, I kind of changed it because to, I, I couldn't sit comfortably with the end. So, so in the end, we just said that she doesn't marry. She just tells him, get lost. And um, she becomes a teacher, you know. She, she, she does something of her own. Basically, I wanted to show her she's doing something of her own. So she became a teacher. And that's also, I mean, if I think about it now, that's also a very um, uh, safe kind of a year. You know, I could have done many other things, but that's where I was when I was my first film. <laughs> so at the time, uh, at the time that you made that film uh, and even listening to the kind of themes that either you touched on or the women themselves were touching on, uh, there is this kind of an idea of feminism that is also surrounding the time and many things that were made, uh, you know, within the non-mainstream kind of space, there was also a lot of work that was about social messaging. And was that also something that you were very interested in at the time? Yes, I, I think so. I, I think uh, it, it it was very exciting to see, you know, um, women from that region, from Bihar, rural Bihar, you know, making uh, a very bold attempt is talking about things and uh, the polemics of it, you know, like she's using the painting, which is actually used during a wedding <laughs> to, you know, to question this whole idea of um, dowry. So, yeah, that excited me a lot, you know, and, and I felt that and I also I came across a lot of feminist filmmakers, though I didn't see it as a, you know, as a feminism as being like a protest of you know rights of women but also the right to do what you want you know to live the way you want to make films about things you want uh, i would say that that i don't think anyone in the arts can be anything but feminist i mean they will will be thinking in that way don't you think <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i do agree i i think that both feminism and art uh, they offer us exactly those kinds of journeys that you don't have to uh, fit into the categories that already exist in the world but you may in fact find your own path and your own categories for the way you express yourself and i mean i think even when you talk about the women in the painting that they've made and when you speak about how exciting it was at that time to see it uh, it's exciting to hear because now we've become kind of used to that idea uh, that sometimes rights are expressed through folk art etc but at that time with its the newness of the encounter you also uh, it also overturns the stereotype of rural women are oppressed and don't speak for themselves and urban women speak for themselves. And actually the story you told us is like a parallel journey that they, those women as artists are expressing their concerns in their way and you are doing it in your way. Um, but I think it also mirrors some of how your uh, artistic journey has proceeded that in a sense, you don't really, you are an animator, but you're also an ethnographer and a filmmaker. Uh, and an artist and a teacher and many different things. And I mean, I would hesitate to describe you as only one, but somehow you are a mixture of all of those things. And I think, yeah, maybe art and feminism allow us to be those many things at the same time. Um, I, but I wonder if you think about yourself in that way, do you? Yeah, I'm a putter together. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? I put things together. I, 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 I'm, I interpret, you know, I interpret and re, re communicate, you know, what somebody wants to communicate and understand what they are trying to communicate and then try, try and communicate it to those who, who don't really re understand this, you know, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. like a mediator, like a kind mm -hmm. of a mediator. Um, and I like you... being at the edge. I like mm -hmm. at that edge of, everything and nothing what is isn't that edge a little bit scary though to be everything and nothing no i don't think so i think because one has always been in this place 
uh, even as a community, my community has, you know, somebody says, which is your native place? Where are you from? Where do you belong? Then I tell them, you know what? I don't belong in place. I belong in space. So that's fine for me. You know, I can be anywhere and be at home and, and not be at home. I mean, I, I, not being at home is also a good uh, feeling for a good um motivation for a creative person i feel to not be so anchored and be so settled you know mm -hmm. I, I i mean for me it works that way i feel i i think better i work better if i'm not too comfortable what are the things that make you uncomfortable <laughs> this is where i belong this is what i believe is this is yeah. <laughs> this is it yeah, yeah. <laughs> So the over determined an over determined kind of identity and practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because you speak about your community, it also of course reminds me of your beautiful film Mukund and Riaz, and uh, th that makes me think that in a way you belong in a story, right? Like when you say I don't belong to a place, but in a sense you belong in you a belong. story. That story felt I related to that story a lot because it's it's a story about kids, but also as a partition kid, like the kid of a partition person myself, I could uh, connect to that story in a different way. So yeah, while for those for those of us who've had some parallel experiences, the story becomes a way of joining us, so we are different. Uh, why did you decide to make a film out of that story? And could, could, you tell, could you tell those who are listening a little bit about the story, since they might not have seen the film? Yes. It's called Mukund and Riyaz. And it's a story about, uh, you know, my my father's journey, you know, uh, actually, he, we, everybody would relate to this, whoever had, uh, you know, parents who came uh, during the partition. So whenever you ask what happened, you know, oh, partition happened and we came, we came to Ahmedabad, we came to Delhi, we came to Bombay, we came to Pune. I mean, everybody has all these narratives, you know, but nothing beyond that. But I think uh, when my father was not very well and, you know, I think he felt his end was near, he kind of one day told me, everybody talks about, I left, you know, we left so much property behind and we left so many land behind and we didn't have any such thing, but I left my best friend behind and I've never had such good, I've never had such a good friend ever again. So that kind of, you know, I was very curious to know my father as a person, not as somebody who was my father. So, you know, we got talking. And in fact, because he was ill, our conversations usually would be, how are you? I'm not so good. Today this happened, today I'm not. So when we started working on the story, or I said, mm -hmm. you know, do you mind if I write this, you know, your memories down and I can share it with uh, the other siblings. So he said, sure. And, you know, so we started talking and then, I shared it with a friend of mine and that friend said, this is a film. I mean, you should make a film out of this. And I wouldn't have made a film out of it. But, you know, we're living in Ahmedabad where um, there's always this community, communal, you know, uh, conflict, so much happening all the year after year. And it's very, it was so frustrating uh, that how, what do you do? as an individual, what can you do? So I felt this was a story worth telling, you know, even mm. though it was a personal story. And even though it was about uh, the partition, my father didn't want to talk too much about uh, the nasty bits because he said, let's not elongate the fight, you know, let's just stop it here. Let's talk about the nice things, you know. Mm. So, and of course, he, it was more about his, the friendship, with him, with, with his, um, you know, slightly older uh, Muslim friend who kind of helped them run away, <laughs> you know, get the ship to Bombay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so th that's why I made And also, uh, it was a way, actually, the film was a byproduct, to tell you the truth. It was a way to spend time with my father and engage with him in a very happy, manner rather than you know like uh, you're not well and you know uh, what can I do you know feel helpless that way so it was mm -hmm. really uh, wonderful to spend time with him and you know it, it one memory would trigger another memory and you know and he would sometimes laugh sometimes he would cry 
he went through you know all the emotions i think he needed that he never had a closure to to you know being away you know having come away and things like that because they were all very young you know he was like i think 14 or something when he left so so yeah it, there were many reasons for doing it uh, some more social i know societal but also very personal you know <laughs> and the, i mean i think the film is full of that emotion because it's very hard to watch that film and not feel all of these things that you talk about right it makes you smile but it also makes you tear up and um how did you choose the style in which you made the film because you worked with all those fabrics and what yes. what how did you design the film so my father uh, like many people who ran from there you know had no photographs nothing no memorabilia uh, the only memorabilia they had were their own memories and and uh, food habits <laughs> you know those are the things that people carry and still do uh, but uh, he worked in the textile mills you know for many years so cloth was a part of our childhood i've always seen cloth around my mother also likes to sew so we've always had chindis lying around you know mm -hmm. so and i had been to kutch and th those days those women had just started making those narrative panels of the earthquake mm -hmm. uh, which i made later into tanko boleche you know but uh, they had already made these so when i saw those i got inspired and then i through a friend i was able to find this uh, group of ladies who could do this and they had never done figurative stuff they were making uh, cushion covers you know they knew applique embroidery but they didn't know uh, i mean they never made this figurative thing so they were a bit tentative but uh, when you know once i uh, i asked them at least do one and you know once they did that i animated it and took it back to them mm -hmm. to show them and they mm -hmm. were so excited that they said acha hab karenge <laughs> so so you need that uh, you know that collaboration that's how this whole idea of collaboration then you know to con from me uh, doing mukund and riaz yeah. uh, and we had the that, computer technology by then so one could scan these you know if if you had asked me when i was doing uh, my first film at that time i wouldn't have been able to make mukund and riaz so now it was possible to animate cloth and you know yeah i think there are so many beautiful things about the film but also the way that you know fabric because the way that the designs of the fabric are used to make you look at waves that the stripes in the cloths become the waves and that fabric is not just pieces that are applique but that the texture of the fabric and what is in the fabric itself uh, also becomes a figure of some kind in the film which is beautiful so it makes you look also at material in a different way i mean it makes you think about i think material is as much communication as the story it's a meta you know so mm. it works and and you know i was like a woman possessed i was see uh, anything you know and i say oh i can use this for your <laughs> i can use this image i mean this textiles for this and my mother also pulled out a whole bunch of you know fabric that my father had uh, collected over the years because he was a text he was into textiles so he had been to japan so he had brought scraps of cloth from there as well so all of this and even from uh, um, you know shops in uh, dalgarwar uh, muslim community has this wonderful uh, block printing and i told him the story and then he said aapko jo kapda chahiye aap le jaye you know and uh, i saw one uh, one potla you know dirty cloth and i said that's the sea i was struggling what can be the sky you know the sea was the waves but what could be the sky and he said ye ganda kamra aapko chahiye you know main sara khol ke dikha raha hu aap koi bhi thaan le jaiye i told him no no this this works you know but he was so proud because afterwards i acknowledged of course him in the film and i also sent gave him a copy of the film so he was very happy you know that uh, yeah, that my father had a muslim friend and that you know they that he you know brought him like took him safely to a ship during mm -hmm. all this so it had many you know side uh, stories that happened you know there were many narratives that were happening on the side the women uh, who were making those they would every time i would go ah nina benu piece che you know afterwards mm -hmm. when uh, the film was uh, being seen so when mukund is going on his bicycle 
all the ladies turned to the woman who did that and tamara peace jai che you know it was so uh, wonderful to have everybody kind of become a part you know and and feel like it was their story as well Mm-hmm. so that had the lovely kind of uh, communities it built around you know itself also but i think uh, that in the kind of work that you've done actually it also mirrors the very nature of the filmmaking process right i mean although filmmaking is often presented as an you know the art of the auteur and it's of, of often privileges the director but we know that the truth is that films are made by a whole community of people anyway and anybody who has worked in the bombay film industry and i know that there was a panel about it yesterday we know that the spot boys the art directors the kind of knowledge that exists in the film industry and that is brought together to make something beautiful or something engaging uh it really cannot be produced by one person alone but maybe yes by one person driving the ship but the ship is made by many people so i think in the way that actually you there is actually no in your films one of the things that we do see and i wonder if you could comment about this with relationship to the other other arts that you work with other other art styles you worked with which is that actually the fo- that the stories and the styles and the forms that emerge from a community uh we often look at it as something that is from the past but in fact it is no different from so many contemporary forms uh that cannot exist unless we look at them also as a product of a community filmmaking community or musical community um so i wonder if you could uh, if this is something that began to emerge for you as an idea through the other kinds of crafts you were engaged with mm as in uh my work as in the overlap the between around. the overlap between these crafts that are seen as you know folk and belonging to a community mm-hmm. and actually contemporary practice which is also community practice but not seen that way but in some ways do you see an overlap between your practice modern practices of cinema and the practice of making the crafts that you work with actually it's very interesting you ask this question uh, i'll 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 relate one uh, in, uh, thing experience from uh, uh, you know when i was working with the kutch artists you know embroidery mm-hmm. artists and uh, the whole idea was you know actually they are the ones who kind of commissioned me to make that film and they said you know uh, we want people to see us as artists not as crafts people uh, you know mm-hmm. uh, we are also artists because we are telling our stories and things like that so so i'd spend time with them and you know i would go every day and say uh, you know show me your piece and you know when you talk about it what were you trying to do here so i remember one uh, one large panel with a white border i'm saying still i'm saying border and uh, so i said okay uh, you know can you start telling us what you did so she said ama this is the aapne kala raksha ne deewar che so that white border which you know we take it as a border she said that's the wall of kala raksha and i'm so glad i asked that question because it really put me in my place that you know that we assume and then we don't even ask you know we think oh that's this is traditional you know this framing is traditional there was a you know bit in in a vertical uh, embroidery piece there was a white rectangle in between mm-hmm. and what is that um, i thought it was it was dividing the two narratives you know pakistan mm-hmm. india but it was actually the desert that they crossed you know so yeah. so there were things um, that and also every time she showed me you know ye idhar ye hai idhar ye ho raha hai then she would turn and ye idhar ho raha hai in a way it was just like cinematic language you know it's always in the present tense it's moving and you know she's drawing your attention from one thing to the other she's dragging the cloth you know because it can move and you know she's showing you so actually i imitated her gesture <laughs> into the mm-hmm. animation you know mm-hmm. so just like whatever i was experiencing i wanted to bring uh, that feeling also because mm-hmm. i feel much of much of the story because these stories are so many everybody has a similar story to tell but it's mm-hmm. the way they tell it it's the, you know the way they you know give form and shape to it and the colors that they use that uh, it adds to the narrative so i i work with with whatever i have that becomes the most exciting thing i i don't find it limiting and it's challenging but it i find it very exciting because I, now i have to work with this you know and how can i tell it 
the way they are telling it to me how do i recreate this feeling that i'm feeling but it i have to tell it in the language that which cinema requires you know i mean that's our language as filmmakers we we work in a certain way and uh, the the artists are working in their own in the way you know they are existing in space and we are existing in time and space you know we temper temporality is a very important thing and everything follows it's very um uh chronological you know even if you are jumping narratives even if your plot lines are not you know sequen you know chronological in that sense but still in the end it is a chronology you know and for them it's not like that so many times and so many spaces can kind of coexist in that space how to bring that also became a huge um, you know uh, artistic challenge as well as you know and and also documentary in some sense because we are telling the stories the way <coughs> they want to kind of tell it mm -hmm. so i think this, uh, in some sense. i mean most of culture is retelling of another story at one level right and i remember interviewing vijay dandeta and asking him that you know i mean you're listening to the stories of the women the mangyar women and then you're writing down the story so who story is it and he mm. uh, he said beej mein bargat that there is a banyan the, the story is a seed which has a banyan in it and it has you know everybody belongs to the story in other words rather than the story belonging to anybody yeah so uh, very true very true. But, i mean i find i also find it you know interesting that you uh, now that you've talked about documenting and documentary that there is a documentary quality to what you're doing you are of course documenting something but the something that you're documenting it's not in the traditional way that well here is a craft and it is located in this context it's a very different form of documentary practice um when you began to do your work when you began to formally do it when you when you embarked on research um what what is it that you wanted to achieve in the documentary mode that you were going to do how did you think about the documentary mode that you would take on in your work so uh, you know the way one was taught in college you know like what is a documentary is that <laughs> literally you have to bring every perspective and you know not have a voice of your own so to speak or i mean that's a traditional kind of story you know way they, that we were introduced to document of course today things are very very different so uh, that was not very you know satisfying that kind of thing to not have your voice and also uh, not to just have your own voice but also these other voices you know that mm. you are facilitating in some sense you know so the voice um, in, in a way is also not just speaking but also the mm. materials the products and process, things that artifacts they are creating so the embroideries are very much the voice as is as is you know the women talking about mm. themselves and you know their lives so their uh, pro, uh, the objects that they use or the or the things that they create are their own ethnographies you know are their own ethnographic records and we are kind of working with that and with them you know so in that sense it is documentary but it's uh, more to like uh, bring about things they want to tell what is it that uh, mm -hmm. the women want to tell about themselves rather than this is what everyone should know kind of uh, mm -hmm. i don't know mm -hmm. i don't know if i'm making any sense no so yeah i th i think this also pertains to a question that has come in so i'm going to join my follow up question with the uh, uh, question from smita mythological stories are generally not considered realistic how did you navigate the form and the story for bemata and other covered stories but i just want to join a question to that that in some senses the division between fiction and non fiction also feels so artificially created like as if to say there is one truth which is tangible and the intangible is not true because everything that you spoken about that your family and people who migrated at certain points had no memorabilia except their memories is that memory uh, a, a reality is it non fiction or is it fiction how does one depict it in any form right and in a sense traditionally indian more there, there, there is no concept of the documentary in a different way in so much of traditional indian art it is documentary and fiction at the same time most of the time so Absolutely. right yeah yeah so and i think your work really 
like explores that idea but i perhaps you would like to speak about it more in terms of the question from smita that mythological stories are not considered realistically so how you how do you navigate that for bemata they are not considered realistic so how did you navigate oh, the form you know, and the people, story for bemata people to who yeah you're right but you know bay mata is a very real thing for the people in rajasthan i mean they actually worship her and they keep a book by the you know the new born baby with a pencil over there that you know she will write their future so they live in this very liminal world you know whether it's the bheel artists whether it's the coward artists or the coward storytellers the communities who are the patrons of these for them it's very real i mean you know you cannot uh, call it uh, a fiction to them you know for them it's a very palpable reality but uh, for us it is uh, it's a story but for them it is more than a story you know they they actually live it so um, so the story uh, when one is make uh, like bay mata was a wonderful story i thought about a woman having the brains to you know not be satisfied with her job and everybody else seems to be very content to go back to their original jobs but the woman said i don't want to do this anymore you know okay i want to do something else so she gets this job otherwise so the chakki pisra tha you know she was uh, grinding grain uh, and she said i don't want to do this anymore i'm done and this uh, it's very interesting that she was grinding grain because grinding grain is you know it's, it's a big metaphor for you know big you know crushed between two mm. uh, rocks and you know like we two stones and people have such poems i mean we just uh, uh inaugurated inaugurated a book called grinding stories that i designed in which mm. there are songs that women sing when they are grinding grain and it's mm. uh, so so the this bay mata is yeah. this lady yeah mm. <laughs> she's she's not happy with it anymore so the interpretation that i made out of it was a little different to what you know the way for them is she's a bay mata is a very uh, uh, you know uh, important deity who 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 also uh, women who can't have children you know they worship her so that she's also a goddess of fertility mm. Mm. yeah i mean i think that uh, this question and how, what you've responded to uh, towards it also interconnect with a comment from shipra so i'm just going to read the comment because i think it's pertinent to the discussion right now the hierarchy between who the artist is and who the craft person is uh traditionally in india this distinction did not exist the craft person the mason were people who created but the, with the coming of modernity these hierarchies have become entrenched which has created a codified system thank you nina for showing that there is another way to work through this so i mean i think yeah <laughs> i mean it's true of your work and i think that this idea of the division between the artist and the craft person or even the division between fiction and non fiction and these hierarchies of course are related to modernity but they're also related to many colonial ideas uh of what counts as of now and what counts as of the past right uh so i mean it's the same reason that people dismiss bollywood films because they had songs in them and that's not realistic right so yeah but uh, um you but you've had a long preoccupation with the kavad vachaks and the kavad itself and uh, how did this start and what has what has this preoccupation meant for your work and what have you learned from that experience with the covered many things i mean i don't know i actually i saw the covered it's very it's very strange that it has haunted me so many years before i actually said okay let me get down and do something about this because i had seen it in a friend's house and i was like oh my god where did you get want this i want this i want i was like totally besotted with it i had no idea what it was then years went by you know then i saw it again somewhere i wanted to study the fur tradition and and i saw the covered in the fur artist the house of the fur artist so i said ye kya hai so he said oh this is also uh, people use this to tell stories because the fur uh, you know scrolls are used to tell stories you know devnarayan and babaji and all that 
So I said, are these people still around, those who tell these stories? He said, yes. Um, so we uh, slowly, and we, we were having a conference on storytelling in the digital age. So we invited the storyteller as well as the uh, the covered artist. And then, uh, then at some point, I decided to do my research, you know, like a formal PhD. So I then I thought I would start there. So so the engagement started, and we are still in touch. I mean, even now they call me, and they talk to me, and uh, it's like I made my own community, you know. <laughs> I also became a patron, and they call me that during the. Uh, pandemic they they needed help so you know we were trying to see what we can do and then they told me the stories of corona mata you know they have started making stories on corona mata now mm -hmm. you know uh, mm -hmm. I, I wonder if they'll make a you know a coward out of it i don't know in the future but i think mm -hmm. what i learned from the coward and the coward artists is again it's a huge collaboration between mm -hmm. the artists who make it between the storytellers who recite it, between the patrons who demand their images to be painted in the cover. And mm. then the art, the storyteller using these images to tell multiple stories, the same image like we do with a PowerPoint. He uses mm. the same image to tell so many stories. And he tells us, he uses the same image to identify multiple patrons. And he would tell, uh, he would come to your village, Paro, and say, that is you. And he would come mm -hmm. to my village and he'll say to the same image and he'll say, that is you. So mm -hmm. I asked him later, I said, Apne, why did you do this? Why did you uh, say that it is? Her? So he said, aren't we all the same? And don't you also say your this is this and then same thing you say, this is something else. And mm -hmm. I thought, how true is that? You know, that they are using the nature of an image, you know, the polysemy, the polysemic nature of the image to to identify multiple people, you know. So mm. I, I made a book like that. So it, I think it's it's so inspiring. Uh, and, and it is something that continues. I mean, there were so many stories, you know. I mean, uh, we made some of them. But I like the way two storytellers would say this. That's why Bath Vahia is about same story will be completely different by another guy. And that's his brother. His way of talking, the way he tells, because of the patrons that he has, his storytelling is completely different. Mm -hmm. So that's something I learned from them is this complete, uh, even the deity. So if if in a certain village the Meghwals believe this is our deity, Ram, uh, you know, uh, Baba Ramdev, Baba Ramdev is our deity, not not mm -hmm. the yoga way. This uh, he's actually uh, yeah. So <laughs> he say that. Uh, but when he goes to another village, the Rajputs will say something. So he will turn the story. He would modify it, and 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 I think he lives through this subversive means. And I and I thought all art is subversion, isn't it? In some sense or the other. So <laughs> and the way he tells the story, the way he engages. I learned a lot, you know, about storytelling, you know, from them. And I think when you are at that place where, you know, you know so many uh, identities are imposed on you, you know, you're called a, a OBC or you're called whatever, and you don't want to be that. You want to be what you believe, you know, you want to claim your own identity. So these myths become so important to claim these identities. And I could, in a way, also relate to them you know in some sense so uh, being neither here nor there but i'm comfortable and he wants to be comfortable by you know by being a part of a story mm -hmm. i mean we are all yeah. part of stories now yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think uh, i mean uh why when you were talking about it i was thinking so much also about how until recently this idea of version of a version of a version that everything is. And, you know, Christy Merrill talks about this idea of Anuvad in her book, where she says that Anuvad doesn't mean the same thing as translation, where translation means to move from one place to another, translocate. But the word Anuvad comes from the meaning to speak in your turn, so that everything is a rendition and nothing is original creation in that sense. Right. So nobody, yeah, nobody can take away your chap and the way that you speak or the way that you are. And I guess in that sense, 
uh, a lot of uh, what is so compelling about the about popular arts. I don't want to call it folk art. I mean, you started out by saying that you wanted to do something that many people could access and relate to. And maybe a lot of what popular arts or accessible works do for us is it helps us to detach from the determination of our identities, that we don't have to necessarily follow the path that is laid out for us, but actually we can liberate ourselves into being something else via the experience of the story, making a new story for oneself, or the emotions that we recuperate. And I was even thinking that the story of Ahmedabad, the way that you are telling it, that it's, yes, Mukund and Riyaz is a story about your father, about another time and place, but because of the fabric, it is also the story of Ahmedabad and so many other histories besides the communally polarized history that now we are all told Ahmedabad is only that. But in fact, Ahmedabad or any other place is so many other things at the same time and could become another thing too. So I think work like this, like the, what you've told us about the covered projects and your own work, actually gives us that inkling that nothing is set in stone. The story can change if you decide to tell it differently in a way. Yeah. Um, I'm, I think um, a big part of your work, however, has also been teaching. I mean, you have been a teacher and uh, and I think like from the way that you speak about your life, as either a student or a teacher, like you have also inhabited this world a lot for yourself. And there is a question here from Shruti who asks, how did teaching come into the various things that you do? Was it something you always knew you would veer towards? You know, it's. I think my story is all about and I end up doing everything that I never wanted to do or never thought I would do. So. I never wanted to teach, oh my God, that was the last thing I wanted to do. But, you know, it was like I never wanted to do animation, but I got, you know, into doing animation. And then uh, because when we graduated or so-called graduation, you know, because it was like a long two and a half years workshop, they didn't even have a degree for us at that point, you know. So uh, when we finished, the only thing you could do was go to Bombay and work in a, you know, commercial studio, put soap, froth on the soap, you know, that kind of thing. So the uh, only option I had was to teach. So if I if I taught, you know, I could be in a place to teach, uh, I could at least have some time to do my own, you know, films. Whereas if I went to, you know, practice animation as a professional, then the only thing I could do was work uh, in an advertising uh, studio in Bombay. And that was not something I, I found very exciting. So I didn't want to do that. So so I ended up teaching. And then once I got into it, I began to really enjoy it because I felt that teaching actually gives you the opportunity to learn a lot, you know, because you have to you have to read a, you have to study a lot more before you teach. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because uh, students are so smart, they ask you such amazing questions. So they're always making you work really hard and study. Uh, so yeah, that's how. Uh, actually, there's no big mystery to my becoming a uh, you know, teacher because I had very few choices then. But I'm so glad there were few choices because then I, you know, I took this uh, path and it. It's taken me to where I am, you know, it made me also appreciate my teachers <laughs> after I became a teacher. <laughs> yeah. Do you think you were lucky in the teachers you had? Oh, my God, I couldn't be more fortunate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, I, I think, you know, it's a question of being at the right place at the right time. I couldn't say that better for myself because... I was, you know, in Baroda when, you know, all my teachers were like these brilliant people, you know, whom we took for granted for a while because, you know, it's only in hindsight, you think, oh my God, you know, these were my teachers and, you know, but they were the ones who pushed us to think in various directions. We had my most, uh, you know, wonderful teacher, Nasreen Mahmoudi, you know, who taught us drawing, but she taught drawing in a completely different way. And KG Subramaniam, uh, Gulam Sheikh, you know, Jyoti Bhar, Jairam Patel, um, Chhatpur, Kaneria. I mean, there were, I don't know, there were so many wonderful, wonderful teachers that made us think very hard, you know. I mean, Apari Musar, 
and you know, so there were uh, people who taught us art history there were people who taught us you know the painting and all but they never really did uh, teaching they just spoke about they spoke in riddles also half the time we had to go and figure out what they meant you know mm -hmm. but uh, i i think that gave us i mean they also talked about things to us as if we were you know adults and equals they didn't treat us like oh you need to know this and you know let me tell you it was nothing of that sort you know it, there were always conversations so so that way one was very fortunate you know to have this kind of teachers and uh, also in nid you know i came across some wonderful people ashok chatterjee you know vikas suranjan i mean there were amazing people all around us it seems it's an, it's an uh, almost idyllic world that people who are great artists are also teaching who are also part of everyday life i mean there is a hierarchy today that normally you don't have like really famous artists also having a day job of teaching and i can't help but feel that there is a loss uh, that if if the if that the many if a person can't be many things then how does art actually enter everyday life so yeah i think that you were lucky and uh, it's an awesome experience to have but uh, how has it been how has it been for you to be a teacher has it been possible to be a, that kind of a teacher or do the contemporary times call for a completely different art of teaching so when we started teaching we were trying to emulate our teachers you know because we mm. nobody teaches you how to teach you got to figure out your way <laughs> you know do whatever so whatever inspires you you try to be that but today, you know as as time goes by student profile also changes you know and i find uh, you know uh, what what i could do what i would get away with as a teacher you know in the past in, in mm -hmm. current times i do not teach that way i i am still teaching it's very different you know because t students today are so fragile you know they're so uh, uh, very very fragile uh, you 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 cannot uh, they 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 cannot take to sarcasm like sarcasm was something our teachers did to us and you know we also did for a while but uh, and and some of my older students they they regale me with my own stories and we laugh about it and I said i don't believe i said this to you they said yeah you said this to me and that made me think whatever uh, but the, and so we would like our teachers to yell at us you know but our students today don't like to be yelled at that moment you say well they just disappear they won't show mm -hmm. up the next day you know so mm -hmm. so it's like literally you have to change uh, you know your ways of engaging with mm -hmm. them as so even as a teacher you change you know you have i mean if, if to be uh, of any consequence to a student you have to be what they they need rather than mm -hmm. what you think they need mm -hmm. but uh, what, what what do you think what do you think is the i mean it's a big question so you may not really feel like answering it or be able to answer it right away but what do you think is the cause of this fragility that we find ourselves in at this moment because what you're saying happens between students and teachers but it's also something that's in the culture that uh, we cannot be scolded or scolding uh, which to me i mean it, uh, it was very resonant when you said that because uh, i remember a friend of mine once saying to me that oh tumhari daat to makhan hai that it's fun to be scolded by you because it's like yeah, a sign yeah. of affection and apna par affection so yeah what is it that what do you think it is that has caused this fragility that we now exist in i think they have so many pressures of their own you know and mm. also they have um, uh everything laid out for them on a platter you know they're used to um um not questioning so much you know there's a lot of homogenous way of i don't know how to explain there's a lot of conformity uh, mm. the thing is not to be different but to be better then there is that kind of competition but it's if everybody you know you see how they're dressed you know they all wear the same kind of clothes same kind of everything i remember when we were students each one wanted to look distinct and different and you know stand out in front of how many mm. now they're very brand conscious very you know they're very there are you know i mean there are of course 
students there are all kinds of students all the time you know you feel some you come across some i i i have some students i ask them are you sure you're this old you sound like an old soul you know i mean you how come you're so mature and you're thinking so well and so there are students all kinds of students but i think this fragility i don't know i don't really have answers but this is my observation that you know they are uh, they they do not now feel that anybody is listening to them you know i feel mm. they feel less heard mm. or oh, they have told more what to do and also this all the time on the phone you know can i do this can i do that so this decision making which mm. uh, you know they are so dependent on other people helping them make decisions rather than making those decisions and you didn't have a mobile phone you know and you were in in some mountain you were stuck you found a way out you know you found your way home now everybody is on mm. control you know in some sense there's also that control i mm. don't know i wouldn't have answers really far like you said but mm. uh, it it is definitely a change one sees you know all around mm. i mean i thought it was very interesting that you said that they that people don't feel heard since we live in an era of social media where you can actually make yourself heard every single minute of the day if you would like the fact that people don't feel heard is such an interesting observation and i do you think it is linked to the absence of storytelling in our times yeah they don't read it so they they don't exercise their imagination everything is let me take a selfie post immediate gratification how many likes did i get all that you know it's it builds a lot of pressure you know mm-hmm. to be to be seen and to be acknowledged becomes the very important thing so i mean this kind of dissolved boundary that you talk about which neither here nor there becomes difficult to inhabit in a contemporary storytelling environment which is yeah. so rich so i think the best thing is if if there was collaboration you know the teaching changed mm-hmm. the way we teach and uh, mm-hmm. it became again a collaborative thing i think there is some hope you know otherwise there's no conversation happening between generations yeah. Yeah. that yeah. that i think is important it's it's a big sign you know out there yeah yeah um for those who are watching you can also send in your questions because as you can see uh i'm just weaving them into the conversation with nina and uh so you can send in your questions right now and i will address them to her and while we wait for your questions i'm going to ask another one which is that you know you you have said that heritage convers- conservation is very important for you uh can you define how you think heritage conservation should be i think it should uh, be if if people who have been conserving it so far through their practice also wanted to do that because i don't think one this one community decides on behalf of the other that this is important and you carry the burden of you know preserving Mm-hmm. i i feel if it's so important then there has to be a join of hands and also of it being you know there's a lot of appropriation you know especially of the crafts you may have seen so you know then and i'm very i'm, I'm in touch with a lot of artists you know today folk artists and this is their biggest problem you know they feel that people just appropriate their work and uh, you know something that they have worked so hard to preserve so i feel preservation is also not just you know um, elitist kind of or, or you know a museum deciding this is important to preserve that is not important to preserve that kind of thing i i feel mm-hmm. it should be a, it is very important and especially the intangible heritage like stories and you know uh, uh, these crafts and things like that making and stuff you know making is not given as much importance as you know the idea and the concept and things like that so i feel uh, that there needs to be a collaboration there rather than you know um, uh, just asking somebody to preserve or you know somebody appropriating it on, in on on the you know in the idea of of preservation or you know may, making everything a, a commodity mm-hmm. so uh, there's commodity a question from the is a very big uh, you know threat i feel sometimes you know like so many covers are being made into i don't know boxes and dressing tables and mm. i don't know mm. i really don't know 
I mean, they, of course, uh, their livelihood is important and all of that. But, you know, uh, if it comes from the artists themselves, you know, or the collaboration between artists, designers or other people, there is, it would be richer, I feel, for everybody. I mean, you had said that you feel that in the conservation, you want to preserve not just the object, but the storyteller and the story with the object, right? Yes. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, because the museums have objects, but there are no there are no stories about how these objects, what they meant, you know, for people uh, who used them or, you know, or people who made them. Like uh, so many times you see objects, they tell you who used them. They don't tell you so much about who made them <laughs> or, you know, what rituals were performed while making them or mm -hmm. things like that. There's I a question are from Julie. Close. Yeah. There's a question from Julie. It's very interesting to see your films, some using puppet animation, some using fabric stitches and the different styles of painting. With your filmography, I'm intrigued. How easy or smooth was the transition from one style to another? <laughs> I Actually, I don't know if I would transit, but it's just like every every uh, idea or every story has it comes with its own uh, visual language. So I work with it, you know, so Mm, like uh, the stitches speak came with you know the artists who created those narrative uh, tapestries so to speak so I worked with that you know and the uh, uh, puppets um, oh that's zero film yeah that I made because I was very fascinated by three-dimensional animation at that point in time so because I, I feel uh, my material communicates as much as the story you know they work together so like, you know, if you take the five colors and, you know, the way the colors are used in a miniature and the colors are used in abstract art, they're the same colors, but, you know, it just changes mm. the whole way you interact with it. So, so yeah, I, I work with, um, I work with whatever material I get and I, that becomes the challenge for me. You know? I mean, that is my style, I guess, working with what I get. These uh, long consistent. collaborations consistent. and partnerships, I mean, one last question uh, from me. These long partnerships and collaborations, um, are they kind of friendship? Are there kind of friendship between artists that lead to a work, you think? They they become they become friends, you know. They all call me up. They're calling me and asking me if I'm in, if I'm in a boat or what. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Yeah, they, they become your friends. Not everybody stays in touch, but you know, those who do, I mean, sometimes we reach out to them, sometimes they reach out to us. They become your uh, new, you know, your biradari. Mm -hmm. You know, it's community. like you can't shake off, you know, your, your, your relatives, you can't shake off any of these. They become a part of you, you know, once you engage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so before we end, Nina, What's what? Are, what are you working on now, and what do you want to do next in your work? So right now, of course, I don't have the funds. But whenever I mean, you know, I'm not waiting for the funds. I've started working on a story about my mother, and and so it's it's a it's it's a thing with my father's story. So it's her story about uh, the partition. So my mother's story. And my mother is also a seamstress, you know. So again, I, I'm going to be using cloth, but very differently because of how, how she works with cloth. And uh, and in fact, she's helping me with some of the image making. So she's made uh, her own self-portrait, you know, and it's her story, uh, but it's her story is more personal. It's about her being adopted and then she giving up her own daughter for adoption. So it's it's all like lots of narratives in the middle of all this uh, partition happening. So I hope to be able to have that going soon. <laughs> we can't wait to see. Yeah. It sounds wonderful. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for having this conversation with me. And thanks, Urban thank Lens, uh, for making this conversation possible. So I'll hand over back to Superstree now. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Nina and Paramita, for this um, 
was really enriching conversation. Of course, the conversation was about one's practice and how one creates work, how one comes to it, and the journeys one takes. But for me, actually, personally, it was all it was a conversation about life. Because and and it's I think what Paramita what you said right create your own artists and people create their own path and space, and it's what I I often say that uh, it's a life well lived if you're able to live apne dhun me as part of a community. So actually thank you for for illuminating that. Um, yeah, I was quite moved by many of the things that I heard today. Um, and thank you all to our audience who were here, those who asked questions. This uh, conversation is available on the Urban Lens website. Uh, do tell your friends to watch it. It'll also be available on the YouTube channel. Um, this is just the start of the journey. And I hope we can keep continuing talking about many of these things. Um, at 7 p.m. today, it's the closing session of the festival. It's called um, The Future of Cinema, which has uh, Bina Paul, Radha Sesich, and Daniel Mattis. And they will be in conversation with Shabani Hasanwalia. That's in about 15 minutes from now. So hope to see you then. And once again, thank you, Nina and Paramita, and hope to see you again next year um, as part of the festival. See you. Bye. Good night.